All right, well, good morning, everybody. It's great to see your smiling faces. Hope you're having an awesome, awesome summer. You guys are looking great. Everybody look at somebody next to you and tell them, man, you just look good today. Would you do that? Just tell somebody, you look good. Al had you tell each other how generous you were earlier, so why don't you just go ahead and open up your wallet, hand it to the person next to you, all right, because you know, that's how you are now. Man, it's so good to have you with us. Guests, we, we just hope you feel right at home. My name's Dave Melendez. I get to serve as one of the pastors here. I get to serve as lead pastor. So love the chance to meet you. If you're new, I'll try to get out to the lobby as quick as I can right after the service. Love to shake your hand, smile at you, and say hello. I want to welcome all of our friends at the Cabana Club Resort here in Auburndale. Uh, we have uh, streamed both of our services there. So folks on vacation who want to have church while they're away from home uh, can just go to a particular area there and watch our services. So it's great to have you guys with us today as well. Well, go ahead and take that outline if hopefully you have already. I want to invite you to follow along with me. Uh, we've been in a study now for about 10 weeks on really the most famous sermon in the world known as the Sermon on the Mount. These are profound teachings of Jesus uh, that have literally changed the world. And today uh, in this sermon, we're going to get down to some areas that are really, really practical for those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ. Now, this sermon is named the Sermon on the Mount because of where Jesus taught it. It was along the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, uh, kind of on a sloped hill area. And so we're going to just kind of imagine ourselves there right now. We're going to read Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 18. It's a little bit of a longer passage today, but you can see it right there on your outline that is printed for you. Jesus says this, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you even ask Him. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive you. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to others that you're fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now, in these 18 verses, Jesus lays out for us some spiritual disciplines. These are like fundamentals for those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ. And just to help you understand what we mean by spiritual disciplines or spiritual fundamentals, here's just a working definition. A spiritual discipline is a holy habit designed to help us to grow spiritually. That's a spiritual discipline. It's a holy habit that we develop. And the purpose of it is to help us to grow spiritually. You know, followers of Jesus are known as disciples. The root word of that word disciple is discipline. So really, a follower of Jesus is a disciplined follower. There are habits that are important that we develop, certain spiritual disciplines that will then produce spiritual growth in our lives and in our relationship with God. Now, we see spiritual disciplines throughout the Scripture, 
But Jesus focuses on three of them, very important ones, foundational ones for all of us. Giving, praying, and fasting. So these are habits. The habit of giving, the habit of praying, and the habit of fasting. Now there are things that Jesus kind of weaves through this that each of these disciplines have in common. If you're taking notes, write these down. First of all, Jesus assumes that we are already doing them. He says, when you give, when you pray, when you fast. He doesn't say, if you happen to give every once in a while, if you happen to pray when things get really bad, or if you just happen to fast. He says, no, when you do these things, when you pray, when you give, when you fast, not if. So these are, again, just simple fundamentals for those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ. And what Jesus is going to do is really focus on the heart behind these disciplines. So he breaks down for us the why and the heart motivation that he's looking for. The second commonality in all of these disciplines is that they should be done discreetly. They should be done discreetly. That means they should not be done for show. They should not be done, you know, to have other people admire you or think you're awesome or, or just marvel at how spiritual you look and sound and seem to them. They should be done, Jesus said over and over again, in secret, in secret, in secret. In fact, if we were gonna find one verse that was the theme of everything we read, it was the very first verse, verse one. He says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward. From your father in heaven. So he's saying here, this is to be the spiritual, the practice of our righteousness as followers of Jesus, all should be done in a heart of worship, a heart of humility. The focus is God, not to impress other people, not for other people to think we are awesome. So he says, don't, for example, announce these types of spiritual habits with trumpets. He says, don't let the left hand know what your right hand is doing. Jesus is basically saying, as you exercise these disciplines, keep it on the down low, okay? Keep it between you and God. Don't try to push your righteousness out there to impress people. This is truly something between you and God. Jesus actually refers to those who do this for show as hypocrites. The original word there in the original language means actor, pretender or a person playing a role. Jesus says they love to be seen. They love to be heard. They love the pat on the head, the pat on the back. Other people do, ooh, you're just so spiritual. That's what the Pharisees did all the time. They all, everything they did religiously was so that they would be seen by other people, admired by other people, and honored by other people. That's what they wanted. That was their motivation. And Jesus is saying, don't be like them. Now, Jesus wasn't saying for prayer, for example, that there's anything wrong with public praying or praying in groups. Not that prayer only can happen in secret. But if you're going to pray with other people, don't pray and make it a show. I've been around pastors, for example, in a pastoral prayer meeting, and the pastors take turns, and it's like everybody's trying to outdo the last person who prayed. And it's like, is this a competition, guys? What, what's going on here? I've been in groups of other Christians and prayer meetings and stuff like that, and, you know, people pray these humble prayers, and then someone just feels the need to, oh, oh just act like they're, you know, awesome, and they're just wanting everybody to Be impressed by their spirituality in the way that they're, you know, articulating themselves. And Jesus is saying, no, I'm looking at the motivation. I'm looking at the intention of your heart. Are you praying, for example? Are you giving? Are you fasting for God's attention or for people's admiration? Jesus talks about the prayer part and says, listen, it's better for you just to go into your room and shut the door behind you and your prayer closet and make this between you and God. He says the same thing with fasting, right? These Pharisees, they would fast, and if they were skipping a meal or a couple of meals, they'd walk around like, oh, dragging their feet. What's what's going on? Oh, I'm fasting. 
Oh, you are so spiritual, man. That is so awesome. And they would just, you know, look as rugged as they possibly could, as pitiful as they possibly could, so they could get that little applause from, from other people. Jesus is saying, I'm looking for a heart motive that is pure and an act of worship between you and God. The third commonality of these three disciplines is this, that they will be rewarded by the Lord. Each time, Jesus multiple times says there, there, you will be rewarded. Second part of verse four, second part of verse six, verse 18. Now he's not specific about when or how that reward will come, but it'll be both in this life and in the next life, Jesus says there will be a reward as we pray, as we give, even as we fast. Now I'd like to drill down to each of these habits real quickly just to give you some uh, practical concerns for each. First of all, in regards to giving, Jesus talks specifically about alms. Now, the Israelites gave uh, their tithes, a portion of their flocks and their fields and their income as an expression of their worship, but they also gave alms, which were charitable gifts to the poor. And that's what Jesus is referring to here, specifically was giving to the needy and and the poor, but of course, the principle applies to all of our giving, that it should be from the heart, to honor God and not for show. He says, don't let the left hand know what the right hand is doing. Remember, throughout here, Jesus will talk about the right eye or the right hand is supposed to speak of the best of our human faculties. So I apologize to all of you left-handed people. Okay, that's just how the Jewish people thought. So he talks about the right hand of charitable giving towards God or towards people means you're giving your best gift. But don't even let your left hand even know that your right hand is doing it. In other words, when you give, just forget it. You don't need a thank you. You don't need to have your name up in lights. You don't need to make a donation to make sure that there's a plaque with your name on it or a a brick paver out front saying you donated a particular amount. He says, no, let that giving be between you and God. So we're generous to God and to other people because God has been generous to us. How many of you would agree that God has been generous to you? Would you agree with that? Uh, would you agree that God's blessed you far more than what you deserve? I mean, he has. He, we are blessed people. And our gratitude towards God is demonstrated in the way that we give. Towards people, towards God's kingdom work through our local church. This is a natural expression. And see, God wants to make sure that this is something that is pure, from the heart, not for show, not for admiration or to impress other people. So when we really can appreciate that everything we have comes from God, that just makes us more eager to be able to be generous towards God and towards the needs of other people. So Jesus even later on talks about, hey, if you sow sparingly, you will reap sparingly. In other words, if you just plant a few seeds sparingly, you only get a small amount of crop. But he says if you sow generously, you plant a bunch of seeds, then you'll get a much bigger crop. So he's just saying very naturally, there's a blessing involved in generosity. And it's not just financial, right? Some of these... uh, Preachers on TV will talk about this prosperity gospel. So, oh, you know, when you give, that's a seed in the ground. And, and they take it way beyond what Jesus is teaching. And they use it as a form of manipulation to make themselves rich. That's all it is. And they want to exaggerate that beyond what, what he's talking about. God's going to give you, you give your best seed and God's going to give you a Lexus or a Cadillac or, you know, the house of your dreams and all of these things. And the Bible doesn't promise any of those things. He's looking for a faithful heart. This is why, guys, here at Life Church, we don't use pressure or guilt or manipulation manipulating the Bible, manipulating your emotions to get people to give. We don't do that. Because here's the deal. What Jesus is saying is, if you give with the wrong motive, then you don't get the blessing. And we don't want to rob you of the blessing from God. We simply want to give you the opportunity to be generous towards God. And then, you know what? You can know that you'll experience God's blessing. You know, you guys, 
just mentioning this charitable work that we wanted to do to bless families with these backpacks. I mentioned the shortfall and our $4,000 budget for that. You guys on one Sunday toward that cause gave over $11,000. Can we just thank God for that? So Alan was not kidding saying we've got the backpack outreach funded for the next few years, okay? But that just shows exactly what we're talking about. When I talked about that last week, there was no fanfare. There was no crocodile tears. There was no pressure or manipulation. You guys, from your heart, said, we want to bless people. We want to help people in need. And so you guys get it. That's the kind of heart that Jesus is talking about here. How about in the area of prayer? Jesus gets into that one. He's, of course, contrasting the Pharisees and the religious leaders of the day there were some problems that had crept into the prayer life of, is, of Israel at that time. Their prayers became very ritualistic. In fact, people didn't really pray from the heart. Their prayers were basically read, and they were already, already kind of laid out, and they would, they would just read them. In fact, they would reserve their praying for special occasions on specific dates, to memorialize certain festivals and, and feasts and other religious occasions. The other problem was their prayers started getting really long, like really long. I mean, just on and on and on and on. Not only that, their prayers got really repetitious. They would pray certain phrases and words over and over and over and over again. And, of course, they had that problem of the religious leaders in particular of praying to show off. They would literally say their prayers out on the street corner in public, loud, so everybody could just see how spiritual they were. They, they made it a, a, a total show, even in their religious activities. It was all about attracting attention to themselves. Now, notice what Jesus said. He said it multiple times in those 18 verses. He says, if you do these things with the wrong motives, if you give with the wrong motive just for, to impress people or, or for show, if you pray with the wrong motive, to get people to just say how awesomely spiritual you are, you fast for the wrong motive, he, what does Jesus say each time? He says, you have received your reward in full. What does he mean by that? The phrase that's used in the original language of the text is speaking of a financial transaction that is completed. So like when you go up to Walmart and you go to buy something, you... Pay, of course, you always have to do the self-checkout, right, at Walmart because no one's ever at the registers. So anyway, you go through the, the self-checkout, you complete the transaction, you get your receipt, and you're walking out, transaction complete. You paid, you got the item, you're walking out of the store. And there's a little sign that comes up on the little self-check thing, right? It lets you know transaction completed, and the little receipt comes ticking out. That's exactly what Jesus was saying. If you're giving for the thank you or to be memorialized or to show off, transaction complete. All the applause and all the patting on the back that you get from other people, that's all you're going to get because God's not going to bless you at all for that. Transaction's complete. So if you want the earthly acclaim, when that transaction happens and you get all that, enjoy it because you're not going to receive anything from God for that. Because the impurity of the motive. So Jesus is getting down to the heart problem of their prayer lives. And he lays out for us here what we know as the Lord's Prayer. If you're Catholic, this is the Our Fathers, right? Uh, the uh, recited prayer that many people pray. But notice Jesus said, don't pray this as a scripted prayer. Don't pray this in ongoing repetition. Uh, he, he's basically saying that this is an outline. If you'll notice, you read, he says, this is how you should pray. He doesn't say this is what you should pray. So really, the Lord's Prayer or the Disciples' Prayer really is the prayer he taught his followers to pray is an outline of the topics, the themes that we hit in our prayer to God. It's not meant to be a script. It's not meant to be repeated. Because remember, Jesus talked about don't get all super wordy and like you got to get all this flowery stuff going. Not, not by repetition, like you're going to wear God out and make him do what you want him to do for you. He says, just deal with these, head, these highlights. Verse 9, he talks about worship. Our Father is in heaven. Hallowed be your name. 
Verse 10, submission. God, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, in my life and throughout the world. Provision. Verse 11, ask for daily bread. This is where we just ask God to meet our needs and to verbalize those needs to him. Now, he promises to meet our needs, but not our greeds. You guys know there is a difference, right? But he promises, just let me know about your needs. I'm going to take care of those needs. Confession, verse 12, he asks to forgive our debts. And notice how he says it, as we forgive those, as we forgive our debtors, as those who trespass against, against us, other re, restatements of this Lord's Prayer pray. He's, Jesus is basically saying, when you ask God to forgive you, you're asking him to forgive you in direct correlation to your willingness to forgive other people. Very important. Then he asks for, you know, he says, ask for protection, verse 13, spiritual protection, protection from the flesh, temptation, the enemy. Now, often when we look at the Lord's Prayer, we overlook the context. The context of a passage of verses is, means what are the verses before that section that we're looking at, and then what are the verses after that section that gives us context to what is being taught there. So if we look at the context before this prayer that Jesus teaches us, verse 8, what does he say? He says, God already knows what you need. He already knows. So keep that in mind as you pray, that when you're praying, you're not bringing God up to speed on things he's not aware of. Did you know that God doesn't need you to quote the Bible to him? He knows the Bible. Did you know that he's already aware of every detail of every need in your life? So you don't have to babble on and go on and on and on and on and on and over and over and over and over. Jesus is saying, keep it simple because God already knows. He already knows. And that's a very comforting thing that God is always aware and that he has our best interests at heart when we pray. So you're like, well, Pastor David, if God already knows, then why should I pray? Well, he's waiting for us to ask. He wants us to exercise our faith. He wants us to look to him as our source. It's really an expression of humility and worship when we say, God, rather than me trying to sort things out and meet all the needs of my life myself, I'm looking to you as the source of my needs. That doesn't mean I'm passive. Doesn't mean I work, don't work hard. Doesn't mean I apply myself. But, but it means that, God, I'm gonna go to you first. I'm gonna ask for your wisdom, your guidance, your provision in all of these areas. And it truly is an expression of worship, showing our dependence upon God as our source. And this is what pleases the heart of God. And then as God responds, he builds our faith. Have you guys ever noticed a pattern of God answering your prayers that it's just really is encouraging? Can you look back and see things you were praying about last year? And now you look at it, it's like, wow, man, God totally took care of that. I mean, that's just the faithfulness of God. And that's one of the beauties of having like a prayer journal, of writing out kind of things that you're praying about. Because what you'll find is over time, you'll be able to check them off and check them off and check them off. And there's nothing more faith building. I go back through my prayer journal. I, I'm so ADD. When I pray, I literally write a letter to God as I pray. And I go back and read through those prayer journals. It's just like over and over and over again how God got that and he took care of that and he took care of that. And some of those pages have teardrops on them. Some of those pages are expressions of pain. And then I, I can look back and just see what God has done and how faithful he's been. So as you pray, you, you're able to see God at work. And this is something he wants to teach us through our prayer lives. So it's that asking that's faith building. It's walking that journey out as we experience that need. Now, nowadays, there's this thing called helicopter parents. Do you guys know what a helicopter parent is? A helicopter parent is that parent who's constantly, like a helicopter, hovering over their kids. Constantly hovering over them, and that parent will not allow that child to fall, to experience any pain, 
any difficulty. I'm gonna spare my child of any hardship, any bad decisions, any difficult problem that could possibly happen to them. I'm gonna spare, I'm gonna jump in there and swoop in so they never have any difficulties. And folks, the problem with that style of parenting is it's building a generation of young men and women who do not have the skills to deal with problems in life because their parents are constantly jumping in to protect them. Now, the heart behind that is wonderful. Beautiful, beautiful heart motivation, very compassionate, but in the end, it's not very loving. It's good to let your kids learn some things through hardship and difficulty and pain. You know, I think there was something good about the way I was raised. Do you know that I rode my bike all the years as a little kid and never wore a helmet? I actually lived to tell, here I am, I'm alive. Now, do I got some bumps on my head and some scrapes here and there? Yeah. But I grew up in the generation where you wake up in the morning, the kids, the parents kick you out of the house and you come home for dinner. You know what I mean? And so I've eaten dirt. I've ingested BBs. I swallowed a dime one time, not recommending it. Dumb stuff, really dumb stuff. And through all that silliness and craziness and bike accidents and skateboarding accidents and arguments with my friends, do you know that my parents never once intervened in the relational drama between me and my friends? Ever. If I needed help, if I need, had advice, that's something I want to talk about, they always heard me out. But guess what? They left me to figure that out. And can I tell you, I'm so thankful that they did. Nowadays, have you noticed how parents want to come in like the Cape Crusader and jump right into that friendship drama? You hurt my child. How dare? And they'll get on social media and get all lathered up, and they're all into their friend's emotional drama, their kid's friend's emotional drama. And that principle is not healthy. You're not helping your child learn how to cope with the difficulties of life. And can I tell you this? God is not a helicopter heavenly father. He loves you enough to let you go through some difficulty and some hardship and some pain at times because he knows that's the best way for you to learn some life lessons. Now, as a parent, we're not going to let a toddler put their hand up on the stove and burn their finger so they learn the lesson. Okay, that's, that's dumb. But there are certain lessons as your kids start to grow, that you advise them, you counsel them, you, you tell them the best, and then they're going to have to make some decisions, and sometimes they're going to make some really bad ones. And they need to know they have parents who are standing right there ready to help them, guide them, counsel them, realize that they have to take personal responsibility for their decisions, and as parents, we, we walk it out with them in love. See, our Heavenly Father is exactly the same way, and that's what our prayer life does. We, we process our lives with God as our help and our counsel. He's not going to pull us out of every single problem and all the hardships of life, but he's going to take us by the hand, and he's going to Walk us through it. And he's going to teach us through that process. Sometimes, and I guarantee you, there are some of you here today who are here. Sometimes God, in the prayer process, will allow you to wait before you get an answer. Anybody ever been in God's waiting room? Right? When you're praying about something and it's not happening yet. You're praying for wisdom and there still is no clarity. You have the financial need but the provision hasn't been, been, been come to pass. You're praying about a relationship and the status has not changed. God allows us to be in those waiting rooms to develop our character, our dependence upon him, and to get our eyes on him. If you can do a little word study, you know, there are online Bibles and Bible apps. Do a word search for waiting on God or wait on God, and see how often waiting is connected to prayer in the development of our character. It's a very helpful 
dynamic and a healthy dynamic for us as we learn to rely on God in prayer. So the context at the beginning of this prayer that Jesus gives is, just don't forget, I already know everything about your need. I just want you to bring it to me. I want you to trust me. I want you to look to me as your source. And then the context at the end of the prayer is equally and maybe a little more powerful. Verse 14 and 15, look at what he says. He says, if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Wow. So not only in the prayer does he say, I'm going to, God, forgive me my debts as I forgive my debtors. But then after the prayer, he emphasizes this issue. Just let that sink in. Because there's a lot of things Jesus could have talked about. He could have talked about faith here. He could have talked about all kinds of other things related, connected to God responding to our prayers. But of all the things he could have focused on, he focuses on forgiveness as being the key. It's one of the greatest potential spiritual hindrances in our life. As a Jesus follower, you have been empowered to forgive because you have been forgiven by God. And when you refuse to do what God has done for you, you're positioning yourselves above God as though you somehow have a higher standard that someone needs to reach than the standard God made available to you. Well, Pastor Dave, they don't deserve me to, for, you know, to forgive them. Well, did you deserve to be forgiven by God? What did you do to deserve his forgiveness? Nothing. You were totally unworthy of it. Yet, he made it available. In fact, the Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died. So we wanted nothing to do with God. He had already made his forgiveness available to us. So if you're one of those people who have a struggle with forgiveness, and most of us do in various ways, I just want to remind you of this verse, Colossians 3.13. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. You've been forgiven. Now extend that forgiveness that same way that he forgave you. You didn't deserve it, yet he forgave you. He didn't hold a part of it back. He gave you full pardon and forgiveness. And he's asking us to forgive others the very same way. Now, when you forgive somebody, you're not letting them off the hook. If we understand what Jesus is saying, you're letting yourself off the hook when you forgive. You're not condoning or minimizing the wrong that has been perpetrated against you, but what you're doing is you're not letting a cancer grow in your spiritual life and allowing there to be this wedge between you and God. It's the best thing you can do for yourself is to choose to forgive. Jesus made a point to emphasize that. Last thing is fasting. And I want to talk about fasting for a moment because I know for many Christians, uh, many Christians have not really received a whole lot of teaching on this area. I want to give you just a little Reader's Digest. And uh, what's cool is we'll get to talk about fasting and then you'll be able to go home and have lunch. Isn't that awesome, right? So here's what we mean by fasting. Here's biblical fasting. Biblical fasting is denying ourselves food for a period of time to deny our fleshly appetites and to focus our attention on God. Very simple. Very clear, easy to understand principle. The strict definition of, of biblical definition of fasting is no food, water only. No food, water only. Now, of course, if you have health issues, things going on, you always want to check with your doctor. Here's my liability statement for the camera. Okay, I'm not a doctor or medical expert. I'm not giving medical advice. I'm encouraging you to talk to your doctor if you ever want to consider fasting. So there may be reasons why it's not wise for you or healthy for you to go completely without any type of food and fasting. But for the vast majority of us, it is something that we could do physiologically. Now, I understand that nowadays we've kind of modernized this whole idea of fasting and we've made it to include things like I'm fasting chocolate or I'm fasting TV or I'm fasting social media. I would say all of those things are good things to stop for a while. Okay, that's really great. But technically, none of those things are 
fasting. You know, our Catholic friends are into, you know, giving up, the th- giving up certain things around Lent. Um, again, that's not biblical fasting. Fasting is mentioned 65 times in the Bible. It's no food, water only. Now, here's what's crazy about fasting. Is that when you decide, okay, I'm going to fast a meal, here's what you're doing. Your most natural, physical, fleshly appetite is to sustain yourself and to eat. The grumbly in your tumbly, right? That little rumbly in your tumbly that tells you it's time to eat is the most basic, fundamental, natural desire of your flesh. Fasting is saying no to your flesh. And instead of feeding myself physically with food, I'm going to feed myself spiritually and pray and read the Bible for that particular meal if I'm fasting a meal. So it's like working out. Every time you get yourself off the couch and go to the gym to work out, You're saying no to your flesh. Your flesh wants to stay kicked back. Your flesh wants to chill out. Your flesh is like, you're already too tired. You got too many things to do. But you tell your flesh to shut up. We're going to the gym. And you get to the gym and you do the workout and you feel so much better afterwards. You said no to the flesh on the one side. Then you disciplined yourself on the other side. Spiritually, this is a profoundly effective spiritual discipline to say no to the basic desires of your flesh and feed your spirit. So you're making one week and you're investing in the strength of your spirit. And it has profound positive impacts on temptation. All the temptations that we experience are connected to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, or the pride of life. So this is like a spiritual workout routine. Routine. I would suggest if you've never tried fasting before, do some research. There's some wonderful resources out there in terms of practical helps, in terms of how to do this well. I will tell you in my experience, um, start gradually. I had a friend who was like, I'm going to start fasting. He tried to go on a three-day fast the first time he fasted. Not recommended. Okay? You can live a long time without food, but you can't live more than a you know, a few hours really without water. So that's why it's critical if you're going to fast food, you want to drink tons and tons and tons of water. But this guy had never fasted before, and he was going to try to go three days. Didn't work out super well for him. If you want to try, try fasting a meal. One particular meal a week. Maybe you can try it a couple of meals a week. Maybe you can try, maybe at some point, try fasting for a day, which means you have dinner one evening, You wake up the next morning, you don't have anything to eat all day, you go to bed, and you wake up, and then you break fast, and you have breakfast. That's fasting for a day. Here's what's crazy about fasting. Your body will tell you that you are dying. It will scream at you. It'll like, oh my God, you're gonna, and the stomach, and the pain, and the headaches, and you'll go through all that kind of stuff. It's all your body screaming because it's so used to getting what it wants when it wants it. Fasting is saying, nope, be quiet. I'm not listening to you right now. And what happens is your body learns and you will find that as you develop this discipline, you can quiet the flesh, feed your spirit, and it's not nearly as difficult. I want to get into a whole lot of detail because we don't have time, but I'm just telling you this is a wonderful wonderful spiritual discipline that Jesus actually assumed was a normal part of a Christian discipline and will give you strength over many areas of fleshly weakness in your life. So something to grow into. You know, you may want to start with a liquid diet, liquid meal, steak in a blender, if that's where you need to start. You know what I'm saying? Uh, But uh, start small and then just let, let God teach you and help you in that. So Jesus is looking for generous people. He's looking for prayerful people. And he's looking for people who will, on occasion, as a part of their spiritual discipline, deny their flesh and fast. All of these are holy habits meant to draw us closer to God. 
not to impress people. Remember, when we're fasting, the Pharisees, remember, they wanted to let everybody know. So if you're going to try fasting, that's not when you want to go out to lunch with all your friends and be the one person not eating. Have them say, why aren't you eating? Well, it's because I'm fasting. And everyone's like, that's cool, man. Way to go. Transaction complete. Transaction complete. So if you're going to fast, you want to avoid social situations where there's food if you can. You don't need to, you know, brush your teeth, wash your hair, get your clothes. You're not going to feel like you're vibing. But you do all those things, so it doesn't necessarily, no one knows, really needs to know. It's just between you and God. If you're married, my wife always really helps me whenever I do fasting. She, of course, has to know because we're in the same house together. But she really helps me. She'll, like, cook before the normal meal time so that all the smells of food get out of the house before I come home. You can really work together uh, on things like this just to, to help yourself out. So we don't do this to impress people. Gain sympathy, show off, to get the acclaim of people. All three of these disciplines are meant to strengthen the muscle of your soul and draw you closer to God and deeper in your relationship with him. So let's pray together. Would you bow your heads with me right now?